Hello everybody, my name is Kat Bowser. I'm your resident fantasy therapist and welcome back to my channel. We are now on day three of our Halloween videos. So those of you chiming in, make sure you check out the other two videos I've, ever, I've already posted. On my channel, we dig into the psychology of writing. So it seemed only appropriate for Halloween to dig into all the things that make it scary. So we've already talked about the villains. We've already talked about the setting. So now let's talk about the creatures. When I talk about um, these creatures, I'm talking about anything fictional, mythology, and everything that falls in between. So naturally, this is my list. So yours may or may not look different, but I definitely want to um, hear your thoughts on it. So make sure you leave those comments below when we get through this list. So let's get started. Number 15 for me is the Kraken. This, I think, is frightening because the sea itself is frightening. <laughs> um, we still know so little about it, and every year we are finding new things that we didn't know before or new elements about it that we didn't know before. So the concept of a Kraken actually isn't that far out of the realm of possibility. And I like it because it takes so many different forms. Um, depending on what story you read, the Kraken can appear as a giant squid-like creature. That's usually what I see the most. I've also seen a giant turtle-like creature. Um, I've also seen where it's almost humanoid. Uh, I personally prefer the squid. Because squid have always frightened me. And I really don't know why. I think they just look so alien and weird and all those arms <laughs> um i mean there's a reason that uh people used to believe that their ships were being pulled down by giant squid and then lo and behold we go and find not only a giant squid but a colossal squid as if giant wasn't bad enough so this one frightens me i think because on the sea we are very much vulnerable. We, there's not too much you can do. And if your ship or whatever you're on is taken out, you're, you're kind of screwed. So add that onto the fact of something that can pull you under and drown you. If you're lucky. Nope. Mm -mm. Drowning's scary anyway. I don't want to drown right next to a giant eyeball. No, thank you. Number 14, the spiders of Middle-earth. I'm, I'm counting all of these because they're all freaky. I hate spiders. <laughs> um, the most famous one is probably Shelob because she is the one that we see in the uh, movies um, the most. And I think they actually did a really good job with her because giant spiders are really hard to make scary on film for some reason. I think because usually they look too fake. Shelob for a movie that came out in 2003, still looks freaky. Um, still looks very realistic. And apparently, um, Jackson based the design off of the uh, funnel web spider from Australia. Not that you needed to make it any more creepy. Um, there's also Ungolanth, which is Shelob's mother. So Shelob is about the size of a small house or a bus, depending on... Um, your interpretation. Ungolent was significantly bigger. Um, uh, best description I've seen of Ungolent is um, Morgoth was about seven feet high in whatever form he was taking at the time, and he barely came up like this much on one of her legs. Yeah. And then you have the fact that she ate essentially the two trees. She drained them, um, which were essentially the, the lights of the sun and moon before there was a sun and moon. And then she kind of scurried off and disappeared. And Tolkien is very clever in that he never tells you for sure either A, where she came from, or B, what happened to her. 
Um, there's different theories. Some theories say she eventually ate herself because she was so ravenous. Other theories say she's still lurking around in the south somewhere. Yeah, um, that's encouraging. Remind me never to go south of Mordor. Not that I needed a reason not to. But. Number 13, the Banshee. Uh, the Banshee is always something I found interesting in mythology because she, depending on what story you read and which interpretation you're reading, she essentially was a warning sign of death. So if you heard her wail, someone was going to die. And I believe most stories said the next 24 hours. Um, but if you saw her, you were going to die. Oh, that's lovely. That's great. Um, most versions of her I see in fiction are... She's this very quiet, almost... Well, honestly, she's essentially a version of the Grim Reaper, and so it makes sense she kind of shows up in the shrouded, dark, silent, kind of slowly approaching um, persona. And I always find that particularly creepy because, I don't know, I guess things that move fast and things that are visibly attacking you it's almost like we can figure out, okay, here's what I need to do. But with the Banshee, she just, she kind of slowly rolls up almost like a mist. Um, and she just slowly approaches. She doesn't seem to have any, any emotion really to it. It's just kind of like, this is my job. I'm coming to announce that death is coming. And just like kind of with villains, any creature that doesn't really have empathy just automatically puts me on edge and makes me uneasy. So combine that with the fact that she's announcing death and you have a creature I particularly do not want to run into in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. Number 12, the Xenomorph from the Alien franchise. Do I gotta say why this thing is creepy? Like, do I really have to describe why this thing is creepy? Um... The manner in which it spreads itself and creates new xenomorphs. Oh, I'm going to attach myself to your face and then it's going to lay an egg inside of you and it's going to hatch out of your chest. And the thing I, I think is most creepy about the xenomorph too is just the, I mean, the overall alien design. I mean, it, it's definitely, it's actually based off earth creatures. The mouth, I believe, is based off of an eel's mouth which is terrifying. Um, but the it's just such an odd conglomeration. I mean, acid blood um, planting its eggs in something else so they hatch out of your chest. Um, uh, I, they're creepy because they are completely alien to what we know. And they're physically stronger, they're faster, they have, if you injure them, it's probably going to injure you from the, its blood itself. There's, I don't think there's really much more to say about it, except it just creeps me out. <laughs> All right, number 11, the Dementors from Harry Potter. So I'm not the biggest Harry Potter fan, but I always thought the Dementors were interesting creatures. I, de I definitely see the influence of the depression on their creation. So, again, they kind of have that misty kind of um, appear out of nowhere kind of attitude. And just, I like the fact you really, there's no face. There's no facial expression. Um, and then the idea of a Dementor's kiss where it drains your soul out of you. Okay, so getting killed isn't bad enough. Um, anything that messes with the soul really creeps me out because it's so it's more sacred than the body. So if you're you're losing who you are, basically, and they don't and they're so indiscriminate. They they don't care who you are if you're in their path and that's what they're gonna do so yeah I, I 
I see why they were used to guard Azkaban. I still don't think it was a good idea. And it was definitely not a good idea to send them to a school. Don't get it. Still don't get it. Still call BS on that. But creepy creature nonetheless. Next one, the Jabberwock. Which, we, contrary to prophecy belief, is not a Jabberwocky. It's a Jabberwock. This one is fun because your imagination takes care of it for you. Um, Carol, there were some illustrations of it, but he never flat came out and said, okay, here's what the Jabberwock looks like. And the whole poem is nothing but nonsense words. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borrow groves, and the moam raths outgrabe. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the Jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. And yet it creates a feel of this dragon-like horrible creature. Um, there was actually a old, uh, I think it was a 1970s TV version of Alice Through the Looking Glass, which had a Jabberwocky in it, or Jabberwock in it. The effects are horrible. I am not going to lie, they are horrible. But the overall mood that it created, that thing still scares me. Just because of the reaction of the characters, the ambience that they created around this creature, and then just the overall feel of something that is just designed to, to scare you. But it does its job well, I'll give it that. All right, number nine, the Skinwalker from Native American Legend. I actually learned about this from my husband because he did a lot of work with um, Native American tribes. And as he told me, he said that um, it is so ingrained in their culture that police will st are still required to go out to, for people who are reporting skinwalker um, activity, which I think is very interesting because it's not very often that we acknowledge and respect um, the traditional tales of the culture. So I, I kind of like that. So what is a skinwalker? Apparently, from what I understand, it is a creature, a person, a witch, a warlock, however, however they phrase it, that can turn into an animal. And uh, most of the shows I've seen, it's usually a wolf type creature. And it's generally not, um, from what I understand, and like I said, I'm not expert on this legend, but it always seems to be a negative transformation, like the animalistic instinct takes over and it becomes a, essentially a killing machine, but then they can turn back into human and get away. So the idea that you never know if who you're talking to is one of these things or not, I, I think that unknowing is what really adds to it. Anytime you're faced with an unknowing it just adds to the creepiness because it's kind of like when you're in a situation or a location that you don't know, your brain kind of plugs in things that most likely are not true because it's trying to protect you. Same thing kind of happens with this. If you know that there is a possibility the person you're talking to may or may not be the person you think you're talking to, ooh, ooh, and no, no, thank you. Number eight, the Nazgul from Lord of the Rings. So these guys kind of have the same creepy factor as the Dementors and um, the Banshee and that they, they look very Grim Reaper-ish, um, but they attack you physically and spiritually. Isn't that great? Um, they carry around weapons that essentially um, Aragorn refers to as a Morgul blade, um, which essentially is a type of poison. Um, but like a lot of things in Tolkien's world, it not just poisons the body, it can poison the spirit. And when that happens, you slowly become one of them. 
So you don't die. You become the thing that killed you, basically. And I think that's one of those cases where it's like a fate worse than death. Um, so to be trapped in the form of this empty, spiritualist, dark creature and then having to go around and potentially do it to other people, losing your your sense of self. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. And I think the movies really gave them an extra creepiness vibe, which I was I was glad they did because in the books it just creates a overall aura and feeling that just makes you uneasy. And that's hard to translate into film, but I think they did it pretty well. The on rail. I'm probably saying it wrong. My Japanese is horrible. Let, let me just put it. The, the girl from the ring and the, and the grudge. That's what I'm talking about here. So this one I've always found interesting because of the way they are created. They are the spirits of people who have been killed, but... It's people who have died in a very intense emotional state, and that's why it's usually people who have been murdered. Um, and so they come back as this restless spirit that is set on not revenge, but just anything that comes near them essentially gets all this built-up anger that they have, which I always found fascinating because in most stories, at least in my culture, you know, the spirit would come back and go after the people that killed them. And while that does usually happen, that's not all they go after. In some of these stories, they go after, you know, a completely innocent victim who just happened to wander into their space. So it's a mindless anger, a mindless rage. And it's a... It's a kind of mindless rage you can't reason with. You can't reason with it. You can't say, hey, you know, I had nothing to do with your death. You know, is there any, you know, you, you, if you run into one, you're, you're stuck. Um, and they're really, from all the legends and stuff I've read, there really isn't a surefire way to get rid of one. Um, the best you can do is kind of leave and maybe provide some blessing over the place, but otherwise your best your best bet is to just avoid it and an entity you can't defeat that um is not generally one i want to run into um i have no desire to um to encounter any one of these verse six the weeping angels from doctor who okay i'm not a big doctor who fan but I know enough about it that these things are creepy. Um, they are essentially an alien type of race, a supernatural race that can move insanely fast unless you're looking at them and then they become stone. But the second you look away or even blink, they're moving again. And their way of killing you is very just odd. Um, they send you back to the past and they essentially eat up whatever years you would have lived. But I tell you guys, what makes them the most creepy to me is that an image of one becomes one. So if you even have a video or a picture of one, you essentially have one. You have created one. Um, and you don't really realize how often we blink or look away until you have something that moves in the time frame when that happens. I, uh, and the closer they get, the creepier they look. Um, and there's just something about something that should be immobile coming at you and you're never going to be able to not blink. It is a natural reaction. So, at some point, it's going to move towards you, and you know it. And so all you can do is wait for it to happen. Anticipation is horrible. That is the worst. 
because anticipation is often worse than the event, but I think in this case, both are horrible. Number five, Pennywise from It. So I mentioned him in my favorite villain, so I'm not going to go into depth. But the reason I bring it up is because he is a creature, um, and there is presumably more than one of him. Um, according to Keen, uh, the creature actually was pregnant at the end of the story and may or may not have laid eggs. So there may be more than one. So anything that feeds on fear is frightening because fear, like I've said in my other video, is very individualized. So you're essentially faced with something that can take any form and it can see your thoughts. So it knows what you're afraid of. So it can essentially personalize an attack against you to make you feel you're most vulnerable. That is a very difficult entity to deal with because how do you fight against something that can literally know what you are most afraid of? I do like that courage usually weakens it. And I think that's a good lesson about fear, that you don't have to not have fear to be courageous. In fact, you have to have fear to be courageous. But it's one thing when you're talking about, you know, things you may or may not encounter. But going to get up against something and knowing it is going to pick the absolute pinnacle of what you're afraid of. I would probably just leave Dairy Person. Number four, Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street. So technically, Freddy Krueger started as a human. He was a child murderer and a child molester. But he became something else. He became like this dream demon. So that's why I count him more as a creature than I do a man. Like I've mentioned before, why I think Elm Street is the scariest you have to sleep. And Freddy Krueger attacks you there. Attacks you where you don't really have much you can fight back with. Um, because kind of like Pennywise, he knows what you're afraid of. And he narrows in on that. And the idea that you can, if you die in your dream, you die when you're awake. This was actually, Wes Craven actually got the idea for this from very real events that happened. And by real events, I mean there were a couple of, um, I believe it was Pacific Islanders, yeah, immigrants that had come and one of, one of the children was terrified to sleep absolutely petrified to sleep, didn't want to sleep at all, um, would stash coffee under his bed, would, um, would uh, cheek the sleeping pills they were giving him because he was just terrified of going to sleep. Well, naturally, eventually the body went out and he finally fell asleep. And they said within an hour of him falling asleep, he was having a seizure and he died. The idea that Freddy Krueger's was based or inspired by real life events just makes it all the scarier. Okay, number three, the pale man from Pan's Labyrinth. Do I need to say why this thing is creepy? Um, for me, it's that it just sits there like a statue and it waits. And it's Essentially, it's a child-eating monster. I mean, it's like the things you hear about in fairy tales and stories and things like that, because that's that's its purpose. It's essentially a boogeyman. Um, but what they do to make it creepier, I think, is they show it just sitting there, not moving, and Pan is walking all around it. And it's not moving, it's not attacking her, but the minute that she takes food from its table, it puts eyes into its hands and goes like this and wakes up and pursues her. Ooh. When, when you're faced with something that may 
you may potentially get around it without waking it up, you are on pins and needles because you're trying everything you can to not disturb this creature. Because if you can get past it, then you don't have to worry about it. But I think that makes it all the worse because now you're always second guessing yourself. Okay, what did I do everything right? Could I potentially have woken it up? Um, things like that. And then naturally, when we're focused on that, we're going to make mistakes. So the fact that you're so in tune to what you cannot do almost guarantees you're going to do it. <laughs> so just the idea of this thing chasing you and knowing that it has no purpose but to eat you. Slowly. Nope. Mm -mm. I've never liked boogeyman. <laughs> And this is no exception. I don't like this one either. Number two, the gentleman from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh boy. Um, just their image. Oh, a, a set of demons that are dressed in business suits and smile all the time and are very polite. And they come in to cut out your heart and you can't scream. Yikes. <laughs> um, for me, I think the smiles and the not being able to scream is the creepiest part. Because we're, we're in tune to recognize facial expression, you know, smiles and grins and things like that. But we can also kind of catch on when a smile is false and it makes us uneasy because our brains are kind of interpreting, okay, I know that that person isn't smiling because they're happy. So what's really going on? And the brain goes in overdrive. Not being able to scream. Not being able to call for help. Not being able to do anything but lie there and wait for it to happen. The waiting. The knowing you are utterly powerless. Being powerless is a very horrifying feeling. And these creatures thrive on it. And they bring it with them. Mm -mm. No. Um, I think this, this was one of the few episodes of Buffy that I will not rewatch, even though it is very good. Because it creeps me out. <laughs> Number one. This might surprise some of you is Ellie, which is the personification of old age. I actually don't see this one used in movies or books very often. Um, and I think it's a real shame because old age is something that everybody has to face. I'm actually gonna read you guys a snippet of the one, one book I do have, The Last Unicorn, that actually does use Ellie in some form. and I. Think I think this is the best way to kind of tell you guys why she creeps me out so much. Inside the cage, it was darker than the evening, and cold stirred behind the bars like a live thing. Something moved in the cold, and the unicorn saw Ellie, an old, bony, ragged woman who crouched in the cage, rocking and warming herself before a fire that was not there. She looked so frail that the weight of the darkness should have crushed her, and so helpless and alone that the watchers should have rushed forward in pity to free her. Instead, they began to back away silently. For all the world as though Ellie were stalking them, but she was not even looking at them. She sat in the dark and creaked a song to herself in a voice that sounded like a saw going through a tree and like a tree getting ready to fall. What is plucked will grow again. What is slain lives on. What is stolen will remain. What is gone is gone. She doesn't look like much, does she? Luke asked, but no hero can stand before her. No god can wrestle her down. No magic can keep her out or in, for she is no prisoner of ours. Even while we exhibit her here, she is walking among you, touching you, and talking, and taking, for Ellie is old age. The cold of the cage reached out to the unicorn, and whenever it touched her, she grew lame and feeble. She felt herself withering, loosening, felt her beauty leaving her with breath. Ugliness swung from her mane, dragged down her head, stripped her tail, gaunted her body, ate up her coat, and ravaged her mind with remembrance of what she had once been. 
Somewhere nearby, the harpy made a low, eager sound that the unicorn would have gladly huddled in the shadow of her bronze wings to hide from this last demon. Ellie's song sought away at her heart. What is seaborn dies on land, soft is trod upon. What is given burns the hand. What is gone is gone. Old age. If we're lucky, we reach it. But it steals away. And that's what Ellie does. She's the personification of taking away youth. And that's scary because it happens. So a creature completely in control of that? Not one I want to meet. Okay, guys. Those were my top 15 scariest creatures. As always, leave yours below. I want to find out what scares you. Um, and if you enjoy this kind of content, make sure you subscribe. We will be having a new Halloween video soon, and I look forward to seeing you guys then.